For those joining us for the first time, we welcome you. The Cyber Justice Lab is a research center that explores the interplay between new technologies and the law. We're currently conducting the project Autonomy Through Cyber Justice Technology, funded by the Competition of the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Our project brings together more than 50 researchers and 45 partners dedicated to the use of technology and artificial intelligence for the prevention and resolution of conflicts. Also, over the coming months, the Cyber Justice Lab will be hosting a series of online activities that will gather the opinion and experience of legal experts from around the world about uh, the recent events. We'll discuss ethical issues to crisis management, including analysis of the achievement and failures of, of this accelerated technology shift in the legal field. The lab will be presenting varied and relevant content, so stay tuned by checking our social networks and visiting our website, cyberjustice.ca. For today's webinar, Improving Access to Justice Through User-Focused ODR, we welcome Civil Resolution Tribunal and its Executive Director and Registrar, Richard Rogers. Professor and author Richard Suskin recently described the Civil Resolution Tribunal as currently the world's best known and most advanced online public dispute resolution system. In this webinar, you'll learn how the CRT is integrated into British Columbia justice system, its reliance on user-focused design to develop and improve, and how the tribunal uses both technology and ADR principle to improve access to justice. There will also be a discussion of how artificial intelligence might further improve access to justice and the efficiency of the CRT dispute resolution process. So Richard, over to you. Thank you, Maria, and uh, thank, uh, thanks to ACT and the University of Montreal for uh, inviting me to present today. Uh, hope everybody's doing well out there. As uh, Maria mentioned, I'll be talking about the Civil Resolution Tribunal here in British Columbia, or the CRT, as I'll probably refer to it through most of my presentation, and talking a little bit about how we work, uh, the technology we use, um, the opportunities we see in the future for uh, integrating that technology with artificial intelligence tools, and just hopefully give you a, a little better idea of uh, what we're doing here in British Columbia with respect to online dispute resolution. So the CRT is uh, part of the justice system here in British Columbia. Uh, it is uh, arguably the first online tribunal in Canada uh, and one of the first in the world. I know that uh, there may be some people out there from the Ontario Condominium Authority Tribunal, uh, which was uh, launched at about the same time as the CRT and also offers online dispute resolution. Uh, in any event, uh, the CRT goal, uh, or one of the goals of launching the CRT was to bring the justice system to the people. Uh, and that's particularly uh, achieved through the use of online dispute resolution tools. So the CRT was launched back in July of 2016, so almost four years ago. Our initial jurisdiction was over disputes involving uh, owners, tenants, and uh, strata corporations or condominium uh, corporations, um, also townhouses, um, brownstones, those sorts of ownership structures. And so uh, we launched in July of 2016 with those disputes, which amount to about 600 disputes per year, growing gradually over time. I think last year it was about 750. Uh, in June of 2017, the following year, our jurisdiction was expanded to include uh, small civil claims up to $5,000. And then uh, significantly last April, we had jurisdiction added for uh, motor vehicle personal injury claims up to $50,000 and then some associated claims with that uh, through the government uh, insurance or automobile insurance corporation. In July of last year, we also had a small area of jurisdiction added involving disputes uh, with uh, incorporated societies and cooperative associations. And then in February of this year, government announced that it was moving uh, to eliminate uh, tort claims for motor vehicle personal injuries and moving to uh, what is essentially a non-fault or no-fault uh, accident insurance structure in British Columbia. And the Civil Resolution Tribunal will have jurisdiction 
over almost all of the disputes arising out of that uh, uh, insurance structure. Under the Civil Resolution Tribunal Act, uh, it's very clear that it anticipates something uh, different from traditional tribunals from the uh, court system. And it refers specifically to a mandate that we provide dispute resolution services in a manner that are accessible, speedy, economical, informal, and flexible. <clears throat> uh, there's other elements to the mandate, as you can see here from that provision, but uh, that certainly is one that we have adopted as the goals and purpose of the CRT. The Act also incorporates a number of things that anticipate that we will be using technology to resolve disputes. And uh, as you can see here from Section 18 of our Act, it refers to using as little formality and technicality as possible and focusing on speed of resolution. And in Section 19, it anticipates the use of electronic communication tools. And there are a number of provisions that uh, authorize that use and uh, deal with information and privacy issues related to that, for example, uh, but also just uh, definitional issues around those electronic communication tools, ensuring that we have the authority to resolve disputes remotely using uh, ODR. Going back to our mandates, some of the key attributes of the CRT are that we uh, be timely. Uh, as mentioned, we want to be speedy and resolve disputes as as quickly as possible. That involves both resolving them uh, as early in the dispute resolution process as possible, uh, but also getting them through the process as quickly as possible, moving them from intake to resolution, ideally uh, within 60 to 90 days on average. And I'll talk a little bit about that further on when I talk about some of the results we've had. We also want to be flexible in how we resolve disputes. So we do offer alternative dispute resolution techniques uh, through the process, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. We have a, a negotiation uh, stage of dispute resolution as well as a facilitation or mediation stage to the dispute resolution process. We are focused on continuously, continuously improving our processes, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well, where we actually survey our users to get feedback on where we can improve. Uh, we also regularly survey staff and other people to find out uh, what areas we can make changes to to make us both uh, more user friendly, uh, better able to meet our users' needs, but also to resolve disputes more quickly. We also are accessible, and the online dispute resolution is a key factor in that. We are available 24 uh, 7 as far as their online tools. We provide online. Uh, legal information and support to our users uh, through the citizens of British Columbia. And we also have free telephone interpretation for those uh, for whom English is a second language. Uh, we also have a goal of being affordable. Uh, that involves both the fee structure at the Civil Resolution Tribunal, but also uh, just the model that people uh, do not have to take time off work. They can deal with their disputes at their convenience, uh, whether so they don't have to take off time off work, as I mentioned, but also so they don't have to travel to a courthouse physically, drop off papers, come back for trial and those sorts of things. So uh, it's affordable and flexible in that sense. We also want to be efficient, mindful of the fact that we are funded by taxpayers. So we want to use our resources effectively. And that goes back again to trying to resolve disputes as early in the process as possible and consume as few of the resources we have available as possible. Uh, where it is feasible and practical to resolve a dispute. So the title of this presentation referred to user-focused design of our ODR processes, and this slide also relates to that as well. We want to be inclusive uh, to all British Columbians, and so these are some of the uh, considerations we've taken into account, some of the techniques we've used, strategies we've taken to try and ensure we are user-focused, and we include all potential users of the CRT. So we've made, for example, uh, the fee waiver process for someone who cannot afford our services as easy as possible and not requiring a great deal of documentation upfront and only requiring that where we see something that uh, raises some potential red flags. Uh, as I mentioned, we provide uh, telephone interpretation for uh, people whose uh, language is not English. 
Uh, we test all of our systems and processes with advocates, uh, legal advocates from the community, as well as other potential users of our services. So we try and uh, iron out all of the wrinkles in advance of launching them. Uh, we offer multiple ways to connect with the tribunal. So we are not limited to online dispute resolution. If someone, for example, does not have a computer, does not have access uh, to internet, or is not comfortable using it, we do have an option of uh, essentially slowing down the process, but connecting them with them through paper if need be. We offer a paper filing of documents, deal with them by telephone. So there are multiple ways that we will resolve disputes and we're not restricted to uh, using the internet to do so. We do a lot of training with staff on cultural competency, um, and we also do certainly focus on or try to recruit staff uh, from various uh, cultural backgrounds and with various language abilities. Uh, we also accommodate uh, various special needs, and I'll get to some of the examples of how we've been doing that uh, in a couple future slides. And uh, as I mentioned, we're continuous improvement, so we are constantly um, accepting and soliciting feedback from our users as to how we might be able to do better. And again, this slide goes to the fact that we are user focused. So this talks about our development cycle uh, and also our improvement cycle. Uh, the first step obviously is figuring out what we need with our systems and our processes. Uh, then we might design a prototype and develop a prototype for that process or that feature and we'll test it with users both staff uh, but also if it's public facing we'll get end users to test it and as i mentioned uh, there's also advocates that we a group of advocates that we rely on heavily to test our features and provide us with feedback before we release it to the general public we may develop a beta version in some cases and then go to uh, a more formal user testing process before putting it into production. And even once it's in production, we will collect feedback on that um, interface or function or feature, and that will feed into future improvements to that feature, or in some cases, as we've experienced during the last four years, we may completely rebuild uh, that function. For example, our intake, our online intake process uh, was redeveloped uh, about a year and a half ago based on feedback we received over our first two years of operation. So these next few slides go into some of the ways that uh, we are addressing users' needs. Uh, this one talks about our technology being uh, both seamless and responsive. So um, I will talk about the fact that we have end-to-end -end dispute resolution going from our legal information tool, the Solution Explorer, through to the decision process and beyond. Uh, when you are using the CRT's technology, it is also responsive. So you can use your desktop, your tablet, and <clears throat> in many cases, uh, the only technology available to some people is their smartphone and they can interact with the CRT on that. It does not require a separate uh, app that they download. They uh, can just use our website and our applications uh, through the internet and they, are, they will respond to their screen size of the device they're using. I also talked about uh, recognizing that parties have different needs and we try to uh, elicit those needs as we go through the process. So this is an example of a screen from both the online application for dispute resolution, but also we will ask uh, the other parties, the responding parties, similar questions. Are there um, special accommodations that we need to make for you? Whether that be because you have literacy issues, uh, difficulty with the English language or visual or hearing impairment, and in some cases, mental health issues. Once we get this information, we will take steps to find out how best to accommodate it. Uh, in some cases, um, we can't fully accommodate it, but we will do the best we can. And sometimes it's, it's mostly a matter of being aware of the issue. Also, uh, to the right side of the screen, uh, we also recognize uh, the different backgrounds of people, and we ask them for their preference for the personal pronouns that they want us to use when dealing with them, when referring to them. And we will incorporate that into the process as well. 
as well because we are um, our clientele is primarily uh, lay persons. We are not uh, building our process for lawyers. We are building it for our end users who do not have a legal background. And that's reflected in our decisions, which are uh, intended to be plain language and very brief. Most of them are 10 pages or less. We certainly have some, some more complex disputes that run beyond that, but the vast majority of our decisions are under 10 pages. They are also published and available through our website and fully searchable uh, through text. So we do encourage our users to go there, look for similar decisions about the issue that they're facing. One other feature of the CRT that reflects that uh, our main clientele is uh, laypersons is that we do have a restriction on the participation in of lawyers in many of our dispute areas. And that's in section 20 of our act, which uh, requires that if someone wants to have a representative, they do have to request the tribunal's permission. And essentially the tribunal will only grant that permission where it's in the interest of justice and fairness. And there are some exceptions for uh, minors uh, or children and people with uh, other uh, impaired capacity issues. One area of disputes where that restriction does not apply is our motor vehicle injury disputes. There is a, a blanket exception for them. So the CRT has essentially five stages of dispute resolution. The first is providing citizens of British Columbia with information about uh, legal disputes, the areas that we deal with. And I'll talk about the Solution Explorer a little bit more shortly. Uh, once you get through that stage, if you still have a dispute or still want uh, our assistance resolving it, you can apply online for dispute resolution. We will uh, process that application and contact the other party to get them engaged. If they don't become engaged within the defined periods of time, we can issue a default decision against them. Assuming the other party does respond and doesn't get, get engaged in the process, uh, we put them into a negotiation stage, and that is essentially just an online uh, message exchange platform where they can uh, talk about the issues that they have between them and hopefully come to some sort of uh, resolution. If they don't, then we will provide them with a staff case manager who's got uh, mediation training, who will work uh, directly with the parties to try and help them reach an agreement and I'll talk a little bit more about that process uh, in a few slides. Where the parties can't reach a facilitated agreement, we do have a decision-making process. And again, this occurs almost exclusively online where we will collect their evidence and their submissions, put that to a tribunal member or decision-maker, and they will uh, consider the evidence and submissions and issue a decision that is enforceable through the courts. So the first stage in the process, as I mentioned, is getting information about their dispute area, and that is through our Solution Explorer application. And it provides uh, free legal information about the various areas of jurisdictions that we have. It does that through guided pathways, and you can see the example here, where you uh, select your dispute stream, that may be uh, small claims debt, and then it will take you through a series of questions, gradually narrowing down the issue to a specific area, and will provide you with information in a summary report to help you understand both that area and uh, techniques and strategies you can use to help you resolve that on your own. That includes providing tools such as a demand letter uh, and similar uh, a payment calculator those sorts of tools to help resolve the dispute uh, without formal intervention. However, if uh, you aren't able to resolve it through the assistance of the Solution Explorer, there is a link there to help you uh, go to the Civil Resolution Tribunal, submit a formal application, and we'll uh, start the formal dispute resolution process. And we do actually require most of our users to go through that for, uh, informal Solution Explorer process before they start the formal process. And the up, uh, content on the Solution Explorer is reviewed and updated at least quarterly. 
and of course, whenever legislation or the law changes. So once the dispute is in the civil resolution tribunals process, and we have uh, connected with the respondent party, uh, as I mentioned, we put them in this negotiation platform and it is a relatively simple uh, step in the process, requires very few of our resources, it's all automated, but it does provide a way for the parties to connect so they can start talking to each other ideally. And they may at that point be able to work out a payment plan or some other resolution of the dispute. From our perspective, it's uh, a low resource consumption and any resolutions that occur here are essentially gravy um, and don't cost us anything to achieve. <clears throat> this is just a screenshot of the negotiation platform that they would use to uh, contact or communicate with each other. And it, uh, although it's specific to our process, it is in structure very similar to um, um, IM platform. And they just send messages back and forth. If they can't resolve it through that negotiation platform, then we do assign a case manager who works with the parties to try and resolve it uh, through a variety of mediation style techniques. Um, the case manager is, as I mentioned, has mediation background, but also has a fair bit of experience with that uh, area of dispute and will is able to provide a value of feedback to the parties to try and help them understand where the strengths and weaknesses of their relative cases stand. So they might have a better idea of that they should settle or uh, that the other party uh, has a stronger case, for example, or that they have a very strong case and um, can exert that authority. The process at this point is fairly flexible and is directed by the case manager. It can be either asynchronous or synchronous. Often they will have a telephone call between the parties. That just seems to be a common ground at this point, but they can also use uh, email back and forth or the messaging platform that we provide to communicate with the parties either uh, at the same time or they can caucus with one party at a time. Our case managers uh, will clarify the claims and issues with the parties as well. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll help them resolve some or all of the claims in a dispute. They'll also work on resolving any preliminary issues that may exist there that may include limitation period issues, jurisdictional issues, uh, those types of things. And if facilitation is not successful, the case managers will prepare the parties for the adjudication stage of our process including talking about things like the evidence they have, expert evidence, those sorts of issues. Now this is a very busy slide, but it's intended just to show or reflect that our tribunal decision process or adjudicative process uh, is multifaceted and uh, can go many different ways and is very flexible. But at its core, uh, it starts with an exchange of expert evidence between the parties as required by our rules. Uh, the parties may complete an agreed statement of facts and that would be something that's uh, assisted by our case manager. After that, they'll provide their evidence, their other evidence and upload it to our platform. And then uh, we have staff who work with them to prepare what's called the tribunal decision plan. And that includes the evidence, the applicant's submissions or arguments in favor of their case, uh, the respondent's response, and then the applicant has an opportunity to reply. So the arguments uh, in support of their position. That material is then provided electronically to one of our tribunal members. The member reviews the material and makes an assessment as to whether there is sufficient information there to come to a decision. Uh, they have discretion at that point that they can uh, request additional evidence or clarification of evidence or submissions. The member also has the authority to direct that a different type of hearing be held. Um, this suggests that most of them are on written submissions, electronic evidence and submissions, but the member can instead choose to have an oral form of hearing. 
That could be a telephone conference call, it could be a video conference, or in very rare cases, it could be an in-person hearing. Uh, and it's all uh, started based on the written submissions and evidence they have provided, but can be supplemented by one of these other processes. Uh, once the member is satisfied, they will issue a final decision in the dispute. And as I mentioned, that decision is uploaded to our website and searchable uh, in the future. And this screen just uh, demonstrates the evidence uploading screen that the uh, CRT parties will use. And it's accessed, it is secure, it's accessed through what we refer to as their CRT account. Talked about the arguments, the, their submissions. Uh, there are character limits on the submissions, although they can request an extension to that character limit. The 20,000 character limit on the initial arguments is I think equivalent to about seven and a half to 10 pages. And this screenshot shows uh, what the end user will see when they are putting in their arguments. And then as I mentioned, our members, all the material is provided to them electronically. And this is one of the screenshots of what they will see through their portal account. And they will have access, of course, to all the evidence, uh, the uh, pleadings in the dispute, the submissions the parties have made, and any other relevant material. Talked about the decisions already, um, that they are posted to the website and they are plain language. All of our material is geared ideally to be at a grade six reading level um, and no higher. Uh, so it is intended to be available or accessible to lay persons. I also mentioned that our decisions and orders are enforceable through uh, one of the courts in the province, either the Superior Court for some of our decision types, but for small claims, the Provincial Court can enforce our orders. And they are enforced as though they are an order of that court. Uh, most of our decision or dispute areas are subject to judicial review. Uh, so far in many of the judicial review decisions we've had, the court has shown a fairly high level of deference to the CRT. There is an exception for our small claims jurisdictions and uh, parties there who disagree with the CRT's decision can file a notice of objection and that then makes the decision unenforceable and the parties can then proceed in provincial court, small claims jurisdiction uh, and continue their claim there. But just noting that uh, if they exercise that option, and they are uh, no more successful in provincial court, the provincial court can apply a penalty uh, for exercising that option. This slide provides uh, some of the statistics over our most recent fiscal year from April 1st, uh, 2019 through to March 31st of 2020. And in the total column on the left there, you'll see that we received uh, almost 6,000 disputes during the fiscal year. We had uh, 1,750 disputes outstanding at the beginning of the year. We resolved more than 6,000 disputes during the course of the last year, leaving uh, just over 1,500 disputes outstanding at the beginning of this fiscal year. And uh, the resolution methods, uh, you can see that uh, over 40% are resolved through a default process that mainly reflects the fact that we deal with small claims where a lot of the claims are for debt and the respondent just doesn't engage in the process. However, there's other off ramps uh, for those disputes as well, or for many of our disputes, where if the CRT does not have jurisdiction, uh, we will go through a process uh, to screen those out at the beginning of the process. And that's reflected in that number as well. Uh, just over 20% of our disputes um, went to the formal adjudication stage of dispute resolution. So that's using all of the available resources at the CRT. So that means that almost 80% of our disputes are resolved without having to use that process. And the final number there is uh, the number that's resolved by agreement or withdrawn by the other party, usually as a result of a resolution, is almost 40%. Which suggests that we've been fairly successful in 
uh, resolving disputes as early in the process as possible. And as you'll see in this slide, our other goal is to resolve disputes quickly. And this provides information again for disputes that were completed during 2019, 2020. And our average time to resolution for all dispute types, for all resolution types is 79.3 days. So we're resolving um, on average disputes in well under 90 days, which was our goal. And the median time to resolution is actually 45 days. So about 50% of our disputes were resolved in less than 45 days. Talked earlier about the fact that we do seek feedback from our users and we take it seriously. That is part of uh, both our performance measures, but also provides us with input into how we can continu uh, continuously improve our processes. And just some highlights here is that are that uh, uh, over the last six months, 85% of respondents to the survey indicated that the CRT treated them fairly and 80% would recommend the CRT process to others who had similar dispute types. And uh, also mention that 85% uh, agreed that the information the CRT provided prepared them for this, the dispute resolution process. Uh, just a quick overview of the organization. Our budget uh, for this fiscal year is about 14 million Canadian dollars. Most of that is salaries for staff and full-time tribunal members. As you can see in the middle column, we have 19 full-time members currently. That includes the chair and four vice chairs. We have 16 part-time members uh, who are paid a per diem for when they do work for the CRT. Uh, at this point, uh, the vast majority of our work is done by full-time members. And we currently have 80 employees in a variety of areas. Uh, that includes myself, uh, legal counsel, um, the most of the employees are clerical uh, information clerks, but also clerks that uh, handle the vast majority of the dispute resolution process. Um, we also have uh, the case managers that I referred to earlier, the mediation, the mediators who help parties uh, resolve the disputes. And then we have a, a core group that provides our finance and administration and the technical support for our systems. Uh, with respect to that technology, the cost to build it to date has been about $13.5 million. And it was uh, over about an eight year period that that investment was made. And I'll also note that that investment is being leveraged to support other tribunals here in British Columbia. So there are now, I think it's five or six tribunals either on the same platform that we're using or being onboarded to it. And there will be more in the future. Our platform is licensed through Salesforce, which is a customer relationship management platform that has been adapted and customized for our use. Uh, it is cloud-based and we pay about uh, $650,000 a year for licensing and support. And this slide just reflects uh, hopefully what I've indicated throughout the presentation so far in that as you go through the CRT process, uh, you're gradually um, using more expensive resources, going from a fully automated uh, system to something that does require staff support, our case managers, and then finally our uh, decision makers, our tribunal members who make the, the adjudication. However, fortunately, as you go through the process, uh, the number of disputes and the volume that you're dealing with does go down. Uh, but similarly, there's also, in addition to having your more expensive resources, there is also more hands-on uh, manual support required and much less automation as you go through. One of the principles uh, we adopted when we were developing the CRT's technology was to resist automation until we were sure that that automation um, was the most appropriate um, structure, that our business rules were appropriate, particularly as when we went into this, we weren't entirely clear as to what uh, the behavior of our parties would be, what their needs were. And so we did hold off a lot of our automation until we actually knew that. And over the course of the last uh, four years, we have added a number of features that automate our 
uh, intake processes, our screening processes, and so forth. Um, at this point, although the Solution Explorer is regarded as an expert system, it does not use artificial intelligence to support it. However, we have identified a number of areas that in the future we may be able to uh, use artificial intelligence tools to support uh, further automation of our processes. Uh, in particular, I note that we have almost 3,000 decisions of our tribunal members up on our website now, and we should, uh, at least in some areas that are more predictable than others, be able to start using those decisions to help uh, potentially guide future decision making. I should preface this by adding that no formal uh, policy decisions in that area have been made. Uh, this is just the potential areas that we might be able to use AI in. And um, there'd obviously, again, have to be consultation with our end users um, and also consultation with other stakeholders before we go any further. But there is a body of information out there that we can start to use. Similarly, we could use those decisions to help feedback into the Solution Explorer. Right now, all of the content on the Solution Explorer is built manually. Uh, it's uh, relatively time consuming. And in the future, we may be able to use our decisions, legislation and so forth to help build that content uh, and to make it uh, not just more current, but uh, provide broader and more flexible information. Another area that we may be able to use AI is to take those decisions, uh, our rules, legislation, policy documents, and so forth, and provide procedural guidance to our users. Right now, uh, we do have uh, you know, fairly user-friendly processes, but we think that there could be a little more guidance. We still get a lot of inquiries through email, through telephone, and a number of those questions are repetitive and things that uh, potentially with the use of AI, uh, we may be able to help users and allow them to use, um, say, a chat bot or some sort of similar tool uh, to get information specific to their dilemma. And so that's, those are my slides. Uh, this slide provides contact information if you want more information, including my email address. Uh, the CRT is also on Twitter. Uh, the address is shown there and is on Facebook as well. If you want to follow us, our chair, Shannon Salter, is fairly active in that regard on social media. And I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you, Richard. Uh, it was very interesting to see how the CRT um, implemented this uh, this virtual uh, tribunal. And I was uh, I do have questions from the public, but I was uh, I'll go uh, with one question before. Uh, since you were implemented before COVID-19 and all the confinement measures that were taken by government, have you seen any increase uh, with the cases filed through CRT, or have you stayed at the same numbers of cases uh, as you had uh, previously? Um, we've actually seen a decline in our cases over the last month and a half, uh, and we've been tracking that uh, quite closely um, for a number of reasons. The CRT itself, uh, because we operate virtually, has not really been impacted. Uh, we did have some staff who worked in an office, and they've now quite seamlessly been able to move to working from home. Uh, so all our staff now work from home. Uh, what we have done is made accommodations to some of the parties, for example, who may require a little more time. Uh, there may be something that's impacting their ability to respond to a dispute. So we're, uh, we've held off on doing default decisions for the last uh, month and a half. Uh, we're trying to make some accommodations, recognizing that our end users may be impacted by the pandemic. Um, but the actual volume of disputes, surprisingly, has gone down fairly significantly. We've seen it creep back up in the last couple of weeks, possibly reflecting the fact that um, things are loosening up in a number of jurisdictions. Uh, but we also think, and again, often we're guessing at human behavior on these things, but uh, we just think that uh, with everything else that's happening, a lot of people um, that have disputes, pursuing them is the last thing on their mind at this point in time. 
interesting. Um, we'll go with uh, Hannes Westerman, who's asking, do you think the structure of the CRT platform affects the outcome of cases resolved on the platform? As I mentioned, we certainly want to resolve them as early in the process as possible. We want to encourage parties to resolve disputes on their own um, as much as possible. And we think that they're more satisfied with the outcome if they can't. We don't want to leave people thinking that this isn't worth their time to try and pursue and then they end up frustrated that they can't uh, get a resolution of a legitimate dispute. So that isn't the intent or structure, but we do try to provide them with as much information as possible, as early as possible, to help guide their decision making. So that is certainly the intent of the Solution Explorer. I brought this slide up again just to show the fact that um, we have had um, about 55,000 uses or explorations of the Solution Explorer over the last fiscal year, resulting in only 6,000, less than 6,000 new disputes. So only 11% of the explorations of the Solution Explorer go to a formal dispute resolution process. So that suggests a number of things. One is we're not entirely clear how people are using it. We don't have uh, for privacy reasons, have great analytics on the Solution Explorer. Uh, we do know that they are using some of the tools. For example, uh, coming into this, uh, we knew that a lot of people had not even sent a demand letter or contacted the other party about a dispute. So providing with them, providing them with tools to do that even, uh, we think is helpful. Uh, they may be able to resolve it at that point. Uh, many people will use the Solution Explorer to explore a number of different streams or a number of different approaches because of the, the way it's structured, they can do that. Um, but this does suggest that the Solution Explorer in and of itself is helping to resolve disputes and provide people with the information they need. We still do get a lot of disputes that quite frankly uh, are quite frivolous and not based, um, aren't very sound. We do screen some of those to make sure that we have jurisdiction. Um, and there are other ways to get them out of the system as early as possible, but uh, the system is not structured to deter them from going forward. It's structured to provide some protection for frivolous uh, claims against other people. Not sure if that entirely answers the question, but certainly one of the goals is to help resolve disputes that can be resolved as early as possible. Thank you. Um, Shana asked, what was the biggest obstacle you faced when developing the, your platform? For the platform specifically, um, I think I just alluded to that, is guessing to a certain extent at human behavior. So that was one of the key uh, reasons why, or one of why it was really important for us to test things as we went and before we launched them with potential end users. Now, initially in the early days before we were launched, um, we did have some specific stakeholders we could test with some of the stuff, but some of the small claims processes, for example, it was hard to find a specific group of stakeholders to test those on. But certainly um, that was one of the biggest challenge was figuring out, well, if we use this wording, how will people react to it? If we structure the process like this, um, does that make sense to people? I mean, there's obviously similarities in our process to the court system and we, we, we looked to that uh, as the starting point and also the, the legislation required it. Um, but getting as to how our interfaces, for example, uh, would be structured for users, what questions do we ask to elicit the right information, um, that was very dependent on the user feedback and also as we go along, we have changed those as we found out we were not quite right on some of that stuff. So those have been the biggest challenges in developing the actual technology. Uh, and I should say that that doesn't just apply to the, the technology platforms, but it applies to our uh, paper forms that we do use for people who can't use the platforms. It applies to our rules. We get feedback on the, the readability and uh, comprehension of our rules. Um, how our staff interact with them, we provide feedback on that as well. So it occurs throughout the process. Thank you. From Deborah Pressman, looking back now, would you choose a different 
a tech, tech platform or partner or design it in any different way? That's a tough question because quite frankly, the <laughs> Civil Resolution Tribunal is a client of the Ministry of Attorney General and it was a, the ministry that chose uh, both the Salesforce uh, technology platform uh, but also it was developed uh, in a partnership or strategic partnership with Price Waterhouse Coopers. Um, I, I would say we, there are certainly things that we could change and we could change the platform, we could change the uh, strategic partner. Uh, I think we would just end up with different issues potentially. And it's just a technology development project is going to result in issues no matter what you do. Um, I think in hindsight, um, Again, going back to the continuous improvement um, approach is rather than try and go back to the beginning, we are trying to make sure that as we go along, we gradually apply those lessons learned and improve that way. Thank you. From uh, uh, Réjean Michaud, is there any discussion with the government of Quebec regarding implementing the CRT platform in the Quebec jurisdiction for small claims, for example? Um, the, the province of British Columbia, uh, we aren't involved in this. The CRT isn't involved in this, but there is, as we understand that a commercialization agreement with PricewaterhouseCoopers, PwC, um, that allows PwC to go out and market the platforms that we're using, both the Solution Explorer and our case management uh, ODR platform, to other jurisdictions, to other entities. Um, so I know that uh, PwC is fairly active out there with other jurisdictions, but I don't know if Quebec is one of them. Okay. Um, from Amada Maria Arley, clearly the AI, well, clearly AI, artificial intelligence could be used in the Solution Explorer in an optimized way. What are the main items, categorization that you identify that the people make agreements? Sorry, what was the last part of that? I missed that. Uh, what are the main items, categorization, that you can identify when people make okay. agreements? When people make agreements. Um, if the question is what areas of the Solution Explorer would most benefit from AI, um, I, I think the right now the personal injury area is one where um, those are often both clearly covered by uh, the legislation. Um, there are some areas that we don't have any decisions on. Our volumes on the motor vehicle injury claims have been much lower than we expected to date for a variety of reasons. Um, but over time, that's an area where we're talking about quantifiable uh, damages potentially that could benefit from that. Uh, some of our strata disputes, uh, you can see patterns in certain dispute areas that could benefit from, um, in particular, if there was an automatic feedback from our decisions to Solution Explorer to tell people this is the likely outcome if you pursue this or this is the type of um, evidence you need to provide if you want to be successful in pursuing this dispute those sorts of things and certainly in the small claims area um, we see a lot of patterns that have evolved in our decisions um, and there are some of those areas that could benefit from ai uh, a common area that we did not anticipate that we've been dealing with is disputes over pets. And so we have a large body of decisions now about disputes over pets and what people need to consider uh, if they want to claim ownership of uh, a pet that's in dispute, a dog, cat, that sort of thing. I muted myself. <laughs> so we have a, also a question from Erez. He's asking if you can tell us a bit more about the asynchronous communication you have in the platform, how uh, people use those uh, communications, all those um, uh, tools. Yeah, it's primarily the negotiation platform at this point um, for a variety of reasons. Um, certainly a lot of the communications is more formal that they will submit their application. We will get back to them with a request for information, for example, 
or clarification or simply um, issue the formal documentation indicating we've accepted a, an application and then we will notify the respondent. But in the negotiation portion, it is uh, almost exclusively between the parties. We do not get involved unless there's an indication of abuse or an indication that they've resolved it. Um, very few resolutions come out of the negotiation platform, but there are enough that um, it does benefit our bottom line essentially because it requires so few resources to achieve those resolutions. But we're talking probably 1% of our disputes overall um, that go to that stage that get resolved through the negotiation. So as I referred to it as gravy because it's, as I mentioned, very simple for us to achieve without applying any staff resources and it's up to the parties themselves. And it also means that the parties themselves can go away knowing that they resolved this on their own and they didn't really need our help.